This is a J Mix exclusive. First of all, it's an honor. Thank you. Um, not a problem, not a problem. How did you first come to be on Death Row Records? Um, I was working at Track Records in North Hollywood, and um, I did a session as an assistant for uh, Kevin Lewis. And um, he told me that I should uh, look into working over at Can-Am. And so I um, I went over there the next day, and I was on death row. <laughs> uh, who did you first work with when you got to death row? When I uh, first thing I did, it was kind of it was kind of weird because um, over a track, uh, everything was well structured. You knew what session the artist was, you know, what artist she was going to work with. And everything was done between 10 and, let's say, midnight. Um, when I got over to Death Row, my first session was at midnight. Um, I had no idea who I was going to be working with. And uh, come to find out, uh, it was a group called Bloody Mary. Um, I think they did a couple of songs on one of the soundtracks, um, Red Rum or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, I show up and um, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and I uh, begin to think like, oh man, you know, this guy was pulling my leg or whatever, and one of the artists that I was going to work with shows up, Heron. One of, uh, um, I don't know if he was an, yeah, I don't know if he was an artist or if he was a bodyguard or he was just a friend or whatever. But anyway, um, he showed up and the, as an assistant, I, I work, I worked, um, hand in hand with the first engineer and the guy didn't show up. So he didn't show up, uh, the uh, facility wasn't open, and this guy, Heron, was pretty pissed off, and apparently he had, he was in really good with Suge, because the next day everything was fine. Um, and again, the next day the first engineer didn't show up, and so I ended up um, actually working with uh, Heron, uh, this guy, uh, Rick James, and uh, a lady by the name of uh, Blo um, uh, Bloody Mary. And that was my first session. Um, it was kind of unorthodox for the way I was, um, I, I was used to working. Again, you know, coming from track records, uh, you know, assistant, he shows up an hour before the first, uh, sets up, and um, first shows up, and we start working. Um, well, there was no first. I was the second, turned into the first, and um, there was no producers. Uh, these guys had no, um, they didn't have any tracks to record to. Um, so, my first session, I ended up making some beats, or putting some tracks together, um, and recording these guys. Uh, it just so happened that, that while I'm doing all of this, I'm in a, I'm in a brand new room, I'm not used to the room or anything, um, lo and behold, there was an engineer that um, he got off that, that day, that night or whatever, and was resting in one of the rooms. Uh, myself and that engineer ended up being very good friends, and that was Tommy D., Thomas Darty. He came in. He said, don't worry about anything. He peeped his head in and said, said don't, 
you got this, just calm down, and I just settled in. Uh, the guys liked me. My first session was a success. I did that for about another, I did those sessions, those type of sessions for about another uh, two weeks, three weeks. And um, then I actually started working with uh, um, an engineer by the name of Carlos Warlick. And uh, I guess that was the real sessions. So I always tell, I always tell the story as I was, uh, I, was, I, I was tested to see if I can uh, stand up to the pressure for about two to three weeks. Was this guy going to be consistent was he going to show up and after that they put me on a session with uh, DJ Quick as the producer um, Danny Boy as the artist with DJ Quick and G1 producers Danny Boy the artist and Carlos Warlick as the first and um, we worked regular shifts from from uh, that point on um, and uh, things seemed okay, uh, at least for me, because now I'm I'm in a normal routine. Um, what I ended up having to do, though, because I thought I could swing working at both studios, Track Records and at Can Am, and um, I actually have to give uh, 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 Track Records less time. So I did part-time there and, uh, whenever I could and uh, dedicated most of my time to uh, Death Row and Can-Am. Um, not, not then, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I'm sorry, not to interrupt you. Uh, Tom, I interviewed Tommy D. He spoke, he spoke very highly of you, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's my guy. That's yeah. my, you know, that's my guy for real. We, uh, we formed a, a, a real special bond um, from that point up until today. So, um, yeah. All right. Did you ever feel during your time at Death Row that Dr. Dre was unhappy with Death Row? Actually, to be honest with you, um, no. Um, and that's another thing also. Um, prior to me going over to, um, to Can-Am, um, like I said, I was working at Track Records. I lived in Pasadena, California. Dr. Dre was actually doing some, um, I think it was community service or something like that in Pasadena for some charges that he, that he, um, he had picked up somewhere. I don't know the exact uh, situation, but he was doing some community service. And um, my my daughter was going to a school out there, and one day um, uh, my um, my wife she's my wife today, but my wife um, um, at the time she was my girlfriend. She went to get Dr. Dre's uh, <laughs> autograph from her daughter, and she mentioned the fact that I, I was an engineer and um, I would love to work over at Death Row. Wow. And he gave her, he actually gave her a card to give to me. And so on that one, you know, on that, uh, that, that one session that I did with Kevin Lewis, I gave him the card, and he told me, come over. <laughs> so it's funny that you would mention Dr. Dre because um, I thought Dr. Dre was, I thought he was doing his job. I, um, um, considering the situation and the conditions, he came in. I worked with him on the dog food album. Um, I was his assistant. Him, uh, Keston was his first. Keston Wright was his first. And um, the thing about 
I guess um, uh, the engineers over at 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 Can Am. It seems to me like they were kind of like reluctant to engineer. You know, so it's like as as a second, it, I just felt like I just came from a studio where they did a lot of mixing. You know, I mean, got uh, um, uh, 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 Tony Maserati and cats like that who would come through and. You'd be assisting these guys, and you know you're learning a whole lot from them. So when I got over there and I started working on these sessions, now I'm doing. You know, uh, I'd set up the the lay charts for the uh, first, and um, set all the presets on all the gear and stuff like that. And if needed, it dialed. You know, I would dial in uh, certain settings on the outboard gear, and not necessarily. Um, play with the uh, SSL as much, besides just taking snapshots and making sure that the automation was functioning right and these guys, you know, that they weren't running into a whole bunch of trouble. But for the most part, um, it seems like a lot of the, you know, the uh, the first guys, they knew how to run the, uh, the automation, but it would basically just do all the EQing on the, you know, on the SSL and, you know, throw some verb or something on there and rolled with it. But uh, Dr. Dre, he seemed pretty good. I work, like, like I said, the, on the dog food record, I worked, I worked with him. And also, um, I also worked with him. It was Dr. Dre, myself, Keston, um, Tupac, and Roger Troutman on the uh, the California Love single. So, um, you know, I uh, I did get a chance to put in some time with him, and um, also while while he was at Death Row and after Death Row. Gotcha. So you know it. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to make Dre look bad. Trust me. <laughs> oh, oh well, 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 well. You know, I don't think it, it, it's a bad thing. It's just like, you know, the question is, was he unhappy? I couldn't tell. Was I sad when he left? Yeah, I felt uh, you know a, a sense of loss. Like, whoa, well, you know, what's going on here? But again, I'm an engineer. I'm working at the studio, so you know, for, for myself, it's like, what's going on? But life must go on. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I just kept kept it moving, kept doing my job. So um, it wasn't until things unfolded, you know, where you you get some news and you say, oh, okay, maybe, and you you know you, Did you uh, just keep rolling on. You worked on the California Love single. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it being Dre's original song. Um, did he seem unhappy that they were using that song? There, there... Um, it, in fact, it wasn't. It, 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 I don't think it was Dr. Dre's original song. Really? Yeah, I don't think that was Dr. Dre's original song. I think it, it, it was actually K. Solo's song. It was a song that K Solo did, and then Dr. Dre, you know, he's a producer, he liked the song. K Solo's album never came out, but he took the uh, the song and did some tweaking and stuff like that, and, and you know, um, uh, Roger Troutman came and they did some additional production and stuff like that, and he got California Love. But it wasn't... Dr. Dre's song, per se. It's not like this is the song that's going on his next album. That was a K solo song. I don't know what anybody else has to say, but um, I put my hands on the reel a hell of a lot of times to know. <laughs> no, I, you're shocking me because this is news. This is this is big news. Everybody seems to think that that was a, you know, a three verse solo song from Dre, and that's what made him leave Death Row. No, 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 no. That that that, that was a song he gave to Tupac. Um, but again, the 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 original song derived from. 
um, K Solo. The did you ever work or uh, see the artist Jay Flex around? Jay Flex, I yeah, I did. I I saw Jay Flex, but I didn't I didn't actually work with him that much because a lot of uh, a lot of guys, you know, man, in in, in the years. Uh, that's passed. A lot of indiv you know individuals have you know they they actually claim that they were there and they did this and they did that. And a lot of times, uh, you know, I'm um I'm, I'm one of those individuals who 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 I kind of like if 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 you if you're fabricating a story, man, I'm gonna call you out on it. <laughs> I'm going to ask you when, where, and why. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No so, doubt. Do you have something in mind that's like, or are you talking about the California love story? No, 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 no. I'm just saying, you know, with the, uh, you know, with, 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 with Jay Flex, I, I, um, I've pro you know, I've seen him, uh, I've, I've, I've seen him, I've never worked with him. Okay, I got you. Well, okay. Yeah, I got you. Because he, you know, he claims a lot of ghostwriting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a um, you know, unless he 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 was uh, a part of Sam Sneed's crew. Yeah. Um, you know, I know a lot of Sam Sneed's guys um, back then did uh, some ghost writing for Dr. Dre um, and others, but you know, I. Um, Never worked with the guy as far as sitting down and recording vocals or anything like that. It was you know, just uh, the different artists that was on. I guess the uh, the ones who had records that would be released. <laughs> um, I worked with them. You know, so. When Tupac got out of jail and come to death row, did you see any jealousy by other artists? Well, that's... Uh, that's a big thing right there. I personally saw no jealousy. What I did, I, what one thing I I I I I knew is that um, things changed the very day this guy showed up. I was there the day he showed up. I was probably the you know, one of the first engineers, second engineers. To see him. In fact, he got out. He came into the studio. There was no one there, and and we had a face to face. All right. Um, minutes later, uh, I got called into Suge's office and sent to Compton to pick up some marijuana. For real. <laughs> You know, I'm like, fuck, I'm an, I'm an engineer, but the thing about it is, is uh, um, a friend of mine was, a, uh, it, uh, it was, was associated with Suge, and this guy, you know, he, um, he had a lot of marijuana. I knew where he was, and so Suge knew that and said, okay, come here. I need for you to go to Compton. Go bring me back some, some marijuana. I probably came back with like a a half a pound of weed, and Tupac bought it all, <laughs> you know, so uh, as far as the jealousy, none, um, I do know that things started getting um, quite heated uh, toward the, um, I'll say the latter part. You know, like after Dr. Dre left, things things started to actually, to tell you the truth, things started falling apart. Or or the appearance that um, things may start falling apart. You know, you start seeing, um, start seeing little little cracks and uh, stuff like that. I don't know if, it, if, if I'm making any sense. Uh, well, there are rumors of artist punishment at Death Row Records. Did you ever see anything like this happen, or did you ever hear of anything oh, like yeah, that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, there was, I saw, I witnessed a couple of incidences. One in particular 
is that of Sam Snead. And um, I think the the reason wa was he ended up in another artist's video. And, um, you know, they had this meeting. Um, I know on the way into the meeting, he, you know, everybody seemed okay or whatever. On the way out of the meeting, he was all lumped up. And um, me, I asked no questions. I just uh, kept it moving. Um, there was uh, incidences where where um, unsigned artists would come to the studio and sit in on sessions, and then they get to writing and stuff like that. And some of the artists themselves didn't like that. They didn't appreciate that. For you know, they're like, "Who are you? Why are you here? Why are you writing to to my song, to my material?" Um, there was a, a point when, um, you know, if we're talking about jealousy and things happening around a death row, uh, it was during the All Eyes on Me um, sessions where um, a lot of strict, you know, a lot of restrictions was placed on everyone in the building. Um, now, were, is it fair to say that there were a certain number of rules working for Death Row Records and going oh, to the studio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them was uh, um, you had to, to, to get searched every day um, as you walked in and out of the, the place. Um, security was basically looking for not necessarily weapons or anything like that, but like um, uh, cassette tapes, bat tapes, CDs, anything that would leak a song or an album or anything like that. There was this, there seemed to be an issue with um, either the artists themselves or a particular group of individuals just um, taking the material to the swap meets and it shows up at the swap meet before it shows up in at the time let's say uh, Virgin uh, or 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 the warehouse records <laughs> you know what I mean it, before it shows up in the marketplace for the public and so they were really really strict on that. Um, and that, it, and, I'm sorry. Was that going on before Tupac's death? Yeah, that was before Tupac's death. That was during the time when when Tupac was actually uh, when when he was released. It wasn't they. You know, that's why I say uh, there was restrictions, but these restrictions fell in place only. You know, to my knowledge, only when Tupac showed up. Once he showed up, it, it was like, no, you know, I, this is not happening. This is this ain't happening. This ain't happening. Um, assistants would have a key to the uh, the tape vault. No one assistant could go in the tape vault by himself. So we would have to go get the uh, the key from. Uh, the uh, the night studio manager who would open the door so that we could go in, come down. Uh, oh my gosh, it was it, it, they, it, it was really strict. It, in some cases, we knew ahead of time. Let's say, for instance, Tupac is is, is going to be in from three in the afternoon until eight at night. That's his work schedule. So at three o'clock, we as an assistant or as an engineer, you get there, you go in the tape vault, and you take out all of his two inches, all of his dats, his cassettes, and you'd lay it out in the control room. He'd show up. He'd say, okay, I'm going to work on this song, this song, this song, this song. Okay, so we take those songs, set them aside, and take all the, 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 the remaining songs back to the vault, put it back on the shelf, 
Um, and then we take out like two or three. Um, at the time, we worked with a, a DAT, DAT tapes. So we'll take out the two, three, or four DAT tapes that's associated with those songs, make sure there was room to record any revisions. And um, we rolled like that. Everything was, uh, was written down that was checked out. And then at the end of the session, I think Tupac was an exception when it came to his work because he could get a cassette or a CD of the song. But anybody else, if they got caught with one of those uh, CDs, that's or cassettes on their uh, person, um, well, those, uh, <laughs> <laughs> those incidences where people get lumped up, you know, it would go down. It's not played. All right. Thank you for that. I hope the statute of uh, limitations is, I'm going to edit this. It's passed on the weed thing. <laughs> well, it, you know what? You know, whether you do or you don't, um, for me, I, I, you know what? I, 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 see, I was talking to, to Tommy the other day, right? And yeah. Tommy was telling me that he just wrote this book, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, he showed me the, uh, the draft of the book, and he says, okay, but I gotta, I'm gonna edit this, and I'm gonna edit that, and, and I, I got to thinking, I'm like, but why? So, you know, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I said, well, aren't you telling the truth? Is, 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 is there anything in here that's fabricated? He said, well, well, I could understand, you know, he had a, a really good relationship with Suge, so I could understand you don't want to, you know, you don't want to put anything in, 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 in the book to, to taint your relationship. Okay, and I think that 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 also in 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 writing or even doing a, do, doing an interview, I'm 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 I'm, I'm clear conscious and, and 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 as aware as I can be to where I don't I don't have to make any mistakes. I can just tell the truth, tell what I know. You know, there's a whole lot a lot of stuff that I don't know that you may hear from someone else and a whole lot you know my experience is different from the other guy you know some engineers got slapped around I never had that some engineers didn't get paid I never had that experience you know so all I can do is just um, you know uh, uh, just tell about my experience and the time I had over there you know I can't um, for anybody else but me. <laughs> no, doubt. no, that's fucking great, man. You're telling me all kinds of crazy shit. I'll, thank you. Um, the nickname Goat Mouth, is that your nickname? Um, you know what? It, I, I think it was for all the engineers. Um, but I think my Goat Mouth meant something else. Because <laughs> most engineers, they got like... Uh, you know, a ponytail and a goatee, and, you know, I had, I didn't have a ponytail, I just had this goatee, <laughs> and um, a lot of times I wouldn't say anything, you know, like, I, uh, I, I just focused on, on, you know, the task at hand, I didn't see any, any reason to, to conversate or actually socialize outside of, you know, if I'm being asked the question, my thing was to stay focused because, I mean, dude, man, who was smoking a gang of weed? You know, there's always liquor going around and stuff like that. I didn't indulge, you know, until afterwards, but, you know, I didn't <laughs> indulge while working. So it was like, oh, man, you know, you got to remember where you at. You can't make any mistakes. You got to stay focused. You got to keep your eye on what's going on. So... So as far as goat mouth, uh, um, Pac used to call me that shit all the time, you know. But in that environment, in that setting, I heard, you know, I heard Dave being called goat mouth because he had a goatee. I heard Mike being called goat mouth, you know. So it, I think it was, it, it was I want to say, it was considered a term of endearment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like if they call you Goat Mouth, 
you must, you know, you, you you must, you know, they must like you or something like that. All right. Well, I'm going to do my questions because you covered a couple of them. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I've been told that in some of these studio sessions that artists such as Tupac could have someone's ass beat pretty much for even any reason. Is there truth to that? A lot of truth to that. And that's one of my, um, one of my little stories. In fact, it, 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 it is an incident that showed me a different side of Tupac Shakur. Because at first I, you know, I used to think that, you know, he was just a, a cocky dude, who, you know, because he was already a star. And, and when I say he was already a star, you know, today we got, you know, so-and-so is an actor and so-and-so is an actor and so-and-so is an actor. You know, before uh, I knew of the Tupac Shakur, the rapper, I, I saw him on the big screen. So, you know, he was a big dude. Okay, so I'm in the studio. And we're, we're at Can-Am Studio A up front. And it, it, Studio A was structured in such a way to, to where it seemed like the console was on a stage. Okay? And um, I told you about these, uh, these unsigned artists, sometimes even um, individuals who came with an artist. Or, or who came to the studio at, at, um, and was, uh, let's say, attending another session, they would come on up to Studio A because Tupac is in there and they want to see Tupac. Well, there was one time when uh, this kid, I don't know his name, I, I, I don't know who he was or whatever, he came, he came to the studio and he must have, I don't know. I don't know what it was. This guy, Tupac asked him a question. He stopped the music because he didn't know who the guy was. He's in his session. And he's like, what are you doing here? You know, who are you? Who brought you here? Anybody know this guy? Why are you in my session? And the guy, I seen this guy drop down on his knees and say, please don't beat me up or whatever. And it was, it, it was kind of sad because it was like, Dude, what are you doing? Nobody <laughs> thinking about nothing like that. But he brought it up. He grabbed Tupac's hand, kissed his ring, and I think that pissed him off. I think that that actually pissed off Tupac. And 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 you know, basically, what Tupac did was have like uh, Muta, uh, Napoleon. He's like, take him outside, and and, and they kind of like started beating on this guy. This guy ran out of the studio, and I've never seen him since. <laughs> But that was an incident to where I looked and I said, this guy, it's not that he don't have a heart. It's like, you know, he's compassionate in a way. He's compassionate, but this little kid is like, he seems like he's an idiot. All you have to do is answer some questions. Why are you dropping down and kissing this dude's hands like he's God or somebody else in or an emperor or something like that. So <laughs> I start, you know, from, from that day. And then there was other I I incidences where there was other incidences where, where, you know, through my own experience, I got to develop this, this real solid liking for Tupac because I remember one time for myself, you know, we're talking about somebody who would have whooped somebody's ass. And and it's the truth. You get full of some Hennessy, get full of uh, some weed or whatever, and things, you know, I mean, they'll tear up the studio and whoop somebody's ass. I, but I remember this one time on where his head was. He was writing a song. I think it was, uh, I can't quite remember the exact song at this present time. But anyway, he's writing a song. And I'm 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 the only engineer there, so I put our reel the tape on, and usually you know back then it wasn't like Pro Tools, you had uh, re rewind and fast forward and play time. So I set the tape machine up and I set it to 
locate points. Locate one is the start, locate two is the end. So once it hits locate two, it would repeat. It would go back to the top and the tape will repeat again. And so I had it set and I'm sitting there and I'm in the vocal booth preparing the mic and making sure things are all right. And the tape reeled off. And this guy started yelling at the top of his lungs. He was, he was furious. Who the fuck told you to stop the tape? What are you doing, you goat mouth motherfucker? Blah, 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 blah. And I just calmly looked at him. I didn't say a word. I walked over to the student machine, reeled the tape back on, took it back to the top of the song, made sure everything was set right, and pushed play. And he just shut up. Everything went back to how it was. Okay, and I didn't say anything. We went through a whole session. Okay, and at the end of the night, Tupac pulled me to the side and said, Look, man, you know, when I'm, when, when, when I'm talking to you, don't ignore me, man. You know, I, I, you didn't know where I was. Why did you stop? I said, Look, Pac, I didn't stop the tape. I got these locate points, and after so many runs, it's like it, it gets erased out of memory. When you was furious and you was doing your thing, th th that's not the time for me to come up with excuses on why this tape machine stopped or even explain it to you. The only thought that came to my mind is this guy is on a flow right now, and my job is to make this tape play again. And he was cool. Ever since that discussion, he's like, oh, oh, you know how to do your job. I'm like, yeah, I'm here to do my job, not to come up with some excuse over why the shit stopped working and that's just, just going to piss you off, make you look like I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? But after then, we, you know, um, we kicked it off pretty good. You uh, know? Dur during that incident, were you intimidated by Tupac? No, no, it wasn't an intimidation thing. It was, it, for, to me, I kind of felt like, like, I felt like he's smoking a joint, he's in a zone, and fuck, you know, this is good enough to where I just, I, man, I, I, lose my, I, I lose my train of thought. Oh, I got, I, I got you. You see what you see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so, so, keeping that in mind, that's why I didn't go like, oh man, well, it ain't my fault, and blah blah blah. What my, you know, like I, 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 I said before, what my thing is is like, yo, yeah, let me put this back on, let me rewind this tape, play, and it was like nothing ever happened. So maybe his yelling kind of like sped up the process, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Because I was actually in the vocal booth getting the microphone ready, making sure things was, was right, and I wouldn't have even known that the tape reeled off if he didn't, you know, I, I, I would probably be thinking like, oh, it's, it's being rewound right now. But it was after a couple of minutes, you know what I'm saying? So. When he started yelling, it was like, oh, what the fuck is wrong here? This dude was cool. You know, what's going on? Oh, tape reeled off. You know what I'm saying? I need to do my job. I don't need to come up with excuses. I want to talk to you about the Machiavelli album. What's up with that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, first I want to ask you, because I asked Tommy this as well. Um mm -hmm. What's up? Did you hear this three-day demo leak? Is there such thing as a three-day demo? Was there a demo to Machiavelli? A demo? No. There was no demo. I mean, when, they stood, when we started making it, we started making it. There was no demos. Um, 
the, the, there's one um, there's one one thing out there that has been floating around for years that uh, <laughs> I always laugh at the um, first of all the title the title was supposed to be like the 12 day theory or some 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 way out it was not seven days the three day theory some shit like that three day or oh no three day or 12 days or something what happened was in the pro in the process of recording we 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 recorded the record not mixed it or anything we recorded the record in 7 days and so we changed we changed it from from 12 or we were supposed to do 12 days and we ended up doing set, so we changed it to 7 days it's it, it, it's something that was done on the fly spontaneous oh let's just do this because one of the things we started doing as um, I'll say a, a crew working on a project was kind of like documenting we made it we started out making a list of songs that we would work on because of that whole process that I told you about with the, the tape vault and all that yeah so we we started kind of like documenting the songs that we was going to work on and within seven days we had I think like 16 songs done not mixed just recorded vocals laid um, tracks and an order you know we had things arranged in a, 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 a certain order that you know uh, um, showing the workflow so as far as the three day demo I don't, I don't remember that one <laughs> <laughs> I really don't remember that one uh, between me and you, I think bootleggers are just selling, like, I don't know, dat rips, different dat rips, and calling it a, mm -hmm. a, a demo or something like that. Well, 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 probably because, um, like I said, I was uh, I was talking to Tommy, like, last weekend, right, and I'm over at his spot, and he's like, man, you ever, you ever heard this song? And he played this beat that I did. And I'm like, what the fuck? What? And it had Tupac's vocals on it. And I'm like, what? Hold up, yo. And when I said, look, man, he's, he, he's like, you did this beat, right, Lance? I'm like, yeah. I did the song at a time when what I used to do is this. I, I, the, the assistant would always stay behind, and you got to put all the reels up. You got to zero out the board, put the mics up, wind up all the cables and stuff. So... I made I made tracks. I had an MPC and everything like that, so I would make a track and then push play while I'm doing this. So I'm listening to my own track. Well, it got to the point to where I think it was Noble and um, Edie or somebody came came back in the studio because they forgot something. They heard the track that I was, you know, that I had playing. And they're like, who? It was like Lance or Goat Mouth. You know, who's, whose beat is that? And I'm like, oh, man, that ain't nobody. I was about to turn off the drum machine because I was like, it, it was my shit. It ain't nobody else's shit. I was like, oh, don't, don't worry about it, man. I'm about to go, you know, turn off the drum machine. And Noble was like, no, don't do that. And he went and he called Tupac. And he was like, oh, shit. I said, and so they, they hung around. They, but the, the song wasn't one of them songs that, you know, that that – that I think Tupac wanted to put on, an, uh, you know, uh, the Machiavelli record or anything like that. You know, so when I heard it, I'm like, where the fuck they get that shit from? You know, so there is some songs out there, and I don't know, you know, they already sold Death Row uh, a couple of years ago. So maybe, you know, um, there's some that. A dats or whatever it is out there, and somebody's taking advantage of it. But uh, I was I was just as surprised as as the next guy. <laughs> Every time I hear some, some Tupac shit that I that I thought was uh, was uh, lost, it surprises the shit out of me, man. Do you remember the song that you heard the other night? What it was? Um. 
I, I I don't remember the title. I just you know I, I really don't remember the title. Uh, all right. Oh, you know yeah, the you know the diehard fans are going to want to know instantly. As soon as yeah. That shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I I really don't know the title. That's something Tommy D would have to uh to tell you because he just he, you know he just pushed play and I'm like oh shit and then we had you know some dialogue about the um the the, uh, the song and he was telling me that there's a lot of cats out there and there's a lot of music out there but you know I say oh well. And keep it moving, man. <laughs> you know. Um, Tommy D. Uh, not to keep bringing up Tommy D. He just he acted like you guys worked real close. And yeah, he used to be my roommate, man. Yeah. Yeah, he used to be my roommate. We lived together for like uh, two, almost three years. No doubt. He yeah. he he spoke on not wanting friends on the album. Did yeah. Did, did you guys, did you feel the same way? Well, you know what? I am a, uh, I'm a Houdini, uh, uh, um, a Houdini uh, fan. First of all, you know, like, like I go all the way back to Houdini. So Friends was one of those songs to where I kind of understood where, where it was going and where it was coming from and all that. So basically when we made the song, I, I had much to say about it. I liked it, um, but, you know, based on the lyrical content of the song, because it was a song uh, produced by QD3, and I thought it should have been on the, on, on, on the record, but based on the lyrical content, I understood what Tommy D was saying. You know what I'm saying? Because Tommy D is the one who told Tupac, like, nah, man, um... These lyrics is uh, could be kind of damaging, and you might want to reconsider. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't know the exact um, words that was said, but I do know he he mentioned something to uh, to Tupac, and the song didn't show up on the record. What, not, was to he, not to say he didn't, he, you know, he, he he didn't have other plans for it, but it just didn't show up on this record. What type was uh, Tupac going for a more political social album or a diss album with Machiavelli? Because different stories have been told. Well, um, my take on Machiavelli is that um, Tupac was headed back to um, the Tupac that we we knew. He was headed back along the lines of his first let's say his first three records. Um, when you look at it, all eyes on me was, I'm out of jail, uh, I'm about to party and, 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 and just, just, just enjoy my freedom right now. And then Machiavelli was one of those back to being socially conscious type of records. Not only socially conscious as far as you know what's happening out there in the world, but also what was happening in the in the record industry at that time. And you know, if you if you listen, like like um, <laughs> it was a trip because even then, um, Tupac would say certain things, you know, like it, it, uh, uh, for during an intro or something like that and you wouldn't you know you'd be like oh okay yeah i'm just mixing this oh man that's pretty cool what he said but i i i, I was talking to a friend of mine just the other day because i think i was watching malcolm x or something like that, or roots or something and it was during the point when uh, uh they was about to assassinate malcolm x uh one dude said hey get your hands out of my pocket Right? Yeah. I said, yeah. God damn, Tupac said that shit a whole lot on his records, man. Oh, shit. I, I said, I finally get it. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, so he, he was definitely, um, I say, uh, 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 reverting back to having messages in his songs. Having you know you know deeper messages and you know instead of just the you know the party 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 going back to being 
Tupac talking about, you know, like the Dear Mama Tupac, like the Brenda's Got a Baby Tupac. Not to say that he, he went far away from that, but if you listen to, to, to his first three records, there, you know, there's a lot of, you know, um, social topics that he, he all, you know, that he's always uh, talked about. And on All Eyes on Me, it seemed like he he lost that. It was all about a nice beat and, and you know, yeah, you know, ain't that the you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. So, yeah, Machiavelli um, was one of those records where I feel like, you know, um, the future, you know, um, in the, he, he, he was headed back to being socially conscious. In the his, his future records may have been, you know, a, a little a little bit more um, conscious and and um, uh, uh, projecting more foresight uh, towards what uh, the the atmosphere of the of the, um, the 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 record industry during that time because you know so there's a lot of bullshit going on, man. It even got to the point to where, you know, the reason why I'm saying that it, 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 there, there was a point where, where, okay, you mentioned earlier, was there a jealousy when Dr. Dre left? Now, this is one thing I know for sure, is that, yeah, Dr. Dre left, and, you know, you may have heard on records, uh, you know, Tupac dissing Dr. Dre or whatever, but I always told myself, I said, why would you diss Dr. Dre and then go hang out with him? Hmm. Huh. That don't make no sense to me. You know what I'm saying? Because there was times when Tupac and Dr. Dre would sit down and they would meet. So, so I'd say, you know, during the time there was a whole lot going on. There was a lot being revealed to even Tupac. Gotcha. You feel me? So yeah. um, Machiavelli was that record to where, oh, I need to get back on the seriousness of things. All right. Um, that was slated to be a studio release, right? Machiavelli? Yes. Uh, you know what? Slated to be a studio release, I would say yes. Um, artwork and promotions and all that was already in place. They didn't wait until, you know, uh, um, Tupac Shakur died and then throw, threw that record out. Um, I, I meant, and it's rumored that he wanted to make it like a swap meet mixtape. Uh, no, 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 no. It was supposed to be a, a swap meet mixtape. It was supposed to be supposed to be like a um, I'm not gonna say swap meet mixtape. It was supposed to be a studio release, but more so of you know like uh, blah, you know how, how how can I put it? More like a um, more like a, a mix or blended record to where song one blends with song two and you can just listen all the way down. That's what it was more meant to be. Not necessarily, oh, I'm going to release it to and, and throw it in the swap meet. No. Okay, thank you. No, that's a big clear up because it's... No, 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 that record... See, see, see what people don't understand is, is like this. Tupac... From my own understanding, because I can't speak for everybody else, from my own understanding, um, Tupac had a a three record contract with um, Death Row. He put out two records in one shot. That was the first time anybody put out a double CD as far as rap goes. So that's two records down. 
one of the reasons he put out Machiavelli because he was about to start his own label, Machiavelli, which is the third record, and I, I no longer owe you anything. I'm no longer under your restraints or constraints. You know what I'm saying? Yes. This is, okay, I borrowed, I borrowed three from you. Here is two. I owe you one more, and this is it. I'm out. So that's what kind of record that was. That was the record slated to go in stores. Um, in fact, there was the the the, the uh, during the time we 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 um, was working on that project, there was a lot of um, a lot of obstacles we had to go through. You know, uh, we had kind of like odd hours. Tupac um, wanted to get the job done in not only in, in, in ample time, but um, he wanted to get a, 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 a good record. You know, he wanted to put a good record together. Now, how do you put a good record together when you, you don't have a Dr. Dre and you don't have a, a Daz or a DJ Quick submitting beats? Those are the producers there, okay? Now you got a, a, a Hurt 'em Bad. Now you got a, a Big D. Thank God he had a Hurt 'em Bad because... You know that that kid right there. He he went through a whole lot. He stuck in there, and he was persistent enough to where Tupac finally settled down, listened to some songs, and said, "Okay, I need I, I, you're you're on the team. Let's come do some producing." Daryl, Big D, Big D was under constraint. Big D had to to produce something that would go in the store. He was not he would he he, he he was not such a great programmer or producer, but he he had also uh, did some paperwork with Suge and he wasn't producing and Suge was getting ready to kick his ass. So again, hey here you go this 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 bad dude who 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 um who's always kicking people's ass and got this big tempered Mr. Little Gemini or whatever, you know, you want to call him, he, he sees all of this, and he goes and he gets the D-League, the C-Team, whatever you want to call him, to put a record together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I heard him bad, did a good job. Big D did the best that he could, but he 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 had he had a lot of help, man. When I say he had, he, it wasn't for for myself and Tommy D. This guy, I don't know what would have happened to him, but Tupac put, put put him on the team. Tupac got him used to the quickness and said, "Look, man, just put a kick and a snare on there, and we'll let the engineers deal with the rest. I just want to rap on something with your name on it." Do you think Tupac was unhappy at death row? At a certain point, yes. Towards the end of his life? I'll say, yeah, toward the end of the... Towards the end of... Uh, I'll say the Machiavelli thing, and I'm going to tell you why I think he was uh, unhappy. Because during the making of Machiavelli, um, myself... And um, uh, the Pro Tools editor, who was working with us, because um, it, it was myself, Tommy, and a Pro Tools editor. And myself and the Pro Tools editor, we was at the studio here in Burbank, and um, the studio is really a, a, a was really a post production studio, not necessarily dealing with uh, music, but television. And so we're there, and you know I'm cool mixing on Oratones or NS10. Um, but Tupac shows up for I think he was doing if it's not Gridlock, he was doing some other movie. 
and um, he walks and he says, Lance, can you hear it? It was him and Edie. And um, so I push play, and he says, uh, put it on the big boys, because in the, at Can-Am, at track record or whatever, that's what we did. We put them on the big subs, and oh, my gosh, everybody's heart fell to the floor. You could feel the bass kicking you in the stomach, chest, all that. And um, all the studio had was a, let's say like a 12-inch little woofer. And Tupac looked at me and said, man, is that how my shit going to sound? And I'm like, nah, man. Because he's ready to, he's ready to kick a hole in the wall. I told the guy, nah, man, uh, this is a, um, a post-production uh, uh, facility. Look, they kicked this out of Can-Am. Can Six o'clock this morning, this is the best that Kevin Lewis could do for us. Okay, I said, but, you know, your music is not going to sound like that. He picks up the phone. He calls the office, death row. And these were some of the words, not word for words, that came out of his mouth. He said Snoop was corny. He was taking too much time doing a, doing a record. He'd take all day doing one song. He says, I'm paying Nate Dogg's child support, Rage. Y'all kick my engineers out the studio so that Rage can, can continue working on a record that she's been working on for two years. That's pretty fucked up, okay? And at that point, that's when I knew, oh, wow, this guy is not happy. <laughs> And so when you, you know, the question is, do you think he was happy? Well, I think he wasn't that happy because he stated that I am paying for this. Why, why are my engineers having to suffer? Why do they, why are you guys kicking them out the studio when my record is on, t uh, is, is, is the number one record on Billboard, stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? So that's where, that's where that question comes in. Was he really happy? I don't know. I do know whether he was happy or not, he was making moves, and you, could, you, 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 you saw the signs. He was making moves to start doing his own thing. You know, he, he he would always have his girlfriend at the time, Dada, who was Quincy Jones' daughter. He, she would be there and her promotional people. And, you know, they'd always be chopping it up and doing, you know, uh, uh, I guess talking about branding business or whatever. You know, but he was, he was definitely making his move towards doing his own stuff handling his, you know, making his own records, putting out his own artists, you know, because somewhere along the line, like I said, stuff was being revealed. He started learning the truth about whatever the situation was around there. And, um, you know, the guy was going to leave and uh, go about his way. I don't know if, if he would have left um, furious or if he would have left saying, okay, everything is good, hugs, let's chop it up a little later, I got to go do my own thing, you continue doing yours. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if, that, if that's how the situation was, because that's not how it turned out. You know, destiny is destiny. Is is it true that he tried to take his masters from Can Am? He did, yeah. Yeah, he did. He did, but you know, legally, even Machiavelli, Machiavelli belonged to um, Machiavelli belonged to 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 uh, to, to Suge Knight. So, you know, it is what it is. That well, that brings us to the One Nation album. Did you get to work on that? Worked on that with you know Buckshot and uh, um, those guys from New York, and that was another thing. <laughs> that was that was another kind of like confusing uh, situation to me because you know during that time what was what was in the air was the uh, the West Coast East Coast beef type of deal, and I'm like what. 
the hell is going on here? These is, you know, this is Black Moon. This is, these is, you know, these is guys. These are East Coast guys. What's going on? You know, but that's when it was again to me revealed. Like, oh, it's not an East Coast West Coast thing. This dude ain't mad as, you know, this is not. This is not what it appears, man. You know, so uh, yeah, I did get to work on it. I, I uh, um, did. I worked on quite a few of the songs, if not all of them. I worked on quite a few of them. Did some recording, you know. And Where was this being done? At Can Am, Can Am Studio A, and uh, I, I can particularly. <laughs> Those are some kind of wild sessions, you know. Those are sessions where, you know, you had hookers in the bathroom, you know, and stuff like that. So it was, it was pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. <laughs> for, thank you for this interview. Oh, my God, it's great. Thank you. Thank no you, problem. Lance. Uh, I got a couple more. You got time for just a couple more? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Because I, I skipped over, you know, people want to know about songs. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, re real quick, The Wanted Dead or Alive, you you mixed that song, correct? Yeah. H how much different is the retail version of that song than the original version of that song? Did you guys have to change that drastically? Well, um... The um, the the retail version is um, they basically did like a remix, man. So um, as far as being changed drastically, no, we didn't have to change it. All they did was just what 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 Tupac would would do is let's say for instance, I think Dad did the um, the track. If I'm not mistaken, um, he laid his vocals um, and said, "Mix." <laughs> I'll see y'all later. The, the 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 great thing about Tupac and about those sessions, man. You know, the ultimate goal for an engineer was to do one take. If you can, if we, if you can only get one take, you get to brag that 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 you was the guy who recorded this record in one take. And we used to actually compete to see if that could be done. And um, that was one of those uh, songs. Um, as far as the mix goes, uh, it you know, it's the typical mix um, for a record. You, you know, 24 tracks, with some reverb, some delay, and um, make sure all your levels are right. Um, Make sure you print it right so it can be mastered right, and done deal. So it's not a cut and paste remix. Oh no, no, no! We was back then. We couldn't cut and paste. No, we couldn't cut and paste, man. That was straight up, uh, straight up analog, two inch. Uh, the only reason we would use Pro Tools would be. I think Machiavelli was one of the only records that we really used a lot of Pro Tools, and we pushed a, a, um, a uh, one of the early systems. I think it was Sample Cell 5 or 3 or whatever it is. We, we only had eight tracks, and, and we actually recorded in to that uh, Pro Tools machine and then, you know, uh, uh, bounced it back out to tape. But for the most part, we would only use Pro Tools to sequence a record. It wasn't used to like, you know, you sit there and you, you mix the, the kick and you mix. No, we didn't do all that. So this was not cut and paste in no way. Unless, you know, the version that's out there now, I haven't listened to the joint in, 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 uh, in quite a while now that you brought it up. Um, so I don't know what it sounds like now, you know. I really don't. Uh, that, I, it just, I, I don't know. I know that uh, that Snoop laid his vocals later, but it's uh, people question that song. They don't know if it's like an earlier no, take. No, 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 Snoop didn't. Oh, 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 
You know what? Snoop Snoop laid laid his vocals at um at a track record. He laid his vocals at track record, and um, yeah, he 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 laid his vo vocals at track record, and he laid it after. Yeah, Tupac was already gone because I remember that session now. Uh, it, was, it was Snoop, Dave was there, um, Biz Marquis was there, and um, a couple of other cats. And Snoop did lay his vocals afterwards, but it was on. Um, it was actually on on two inch. That's how we did it. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, that's not a cut and paste. I wish. Is <laughs> <laughs> it so easy back then? <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's a full album of material that was recorded for One Nation? Yeah, there was. There was. Just wanted to throw that one in there. Um, yeah, there was a. There, there, there's at least, at least, I'll say, at least 16, 16 max, 16 songs max that was uh, recorded for uh, for the One Nation record. Um, the, only, the the bad thing about that man is even you know even as we speak and we speak about you know stuff getting leaked and stuff like that like man it it just seemed like the minute the minute Suge got incarcerated somebody don't know who just kind of like went and robbed the bank and just threw it all out there because that's how a lot of, you know, like a lot of, I, I, I sometimes hear songs that were supposed to be on that record and I go, damn, man, how does this, you know what I mean? And even back then, while during Suge's in, in, incarceration, I would always like question like, man, how is this stuff getting out? You go to the swap meeting and see a C, you know, CD of all Tupac shit and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> How did, this, how did this happen? So, you know, I don't know, man. Uh, when things fell apart, things really fell apart. Do you have an opinion on why somebody would do that? Um, not getting paid or um, resentments. You know, people harbor resentments for all kind of reasons, man. And, um, you know... Um, Everybody got to find a way. You know, one of the, I'm going to tell you what's so crazy, man, to me. And, and me and Tommy, we always talk about this. With the exception of Tyrone's tracks and um, Meech's Meech, Meech's tracks, myself and Tommy D, we did a ton of um, additional production. Okay, I mean we 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 hired um, percussionists and all kind of different individuals to come in and work on that record, and then you know it was like Tupac Shakur dies, blah blah blah. Now we hear and you know you know like for instance, and I'm go I'm going to mention the name because it 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 it, uh, it, it, it always bothered me, you know a guy like like Ricky Rouse. For instance, Ricky Rouse was hired, okay, work for hire, to play a part on me and my girlfriend and some other things. Yes, he did. The thing, two parts. was like, yeah, 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 I like that or whatever, and he played the part. But he got paid for that. And so if Tupac was alive, he would have walked away just being paid for that. But the minute this guy, the, the minute the guy died, all of a sudden, everybody is, oh, I'm about to sue because I produced that song, and I did this, and I did that. And that has always been a discussion that myself and Tommy D, we always have and go like, wow, you know, what if we would have sued? Now, we didn't, I didn't feel a need to go that route. Reason being is because, and I don't think Tommy felt a need to go that route either. Reason being is because, when doing the project, we 
developed a relationship with Tupac. He actually told us, you guys are going to be my engineers. You guys, y'all ain't pussies. Y'all, y'all, you, you do your job. You know, I might yell at y'all or whatever, but at the end of the day, I know I'm getting my job done. I'm getting my record done, and you guys are like the best to me, okay? Now, he also told us, let's get this record done, and let's get it done in a, in, in, in a fair amount of time, and you guys are going to get bonuses, okay? I got a $5,000 bonus for doing that record. From Tupac personally? From, I don't know if it's from Tupac or some death row or whoever. But I, I, got, I got that bonus. So, you know, I didn't feel like anybody owed me anything. Gotcha. Okay, and I didn't ask for anything more. I was just happy as an engineer to be a part of the project. And I looked forward to doing more work in the future. The guy passed. It was sad. Um, I felt bad. Felt a sense of loss like everybody else. But I never once just, just uh, you know what, I'm going to sue because, you know what, I did, for instance, Crazy. Crazy was a, was, 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 was a track. I don't know, cra you're familiar with Crazy on uh, yes, Machiavelli, right? Yes, of course. Okay, Crazy was a track to where it was just a kick, a snare, like an 808 snare, and some crazy hi-hat. Again, it's supposed to be produced by Big D. Harper. I sat it in the Neve room over at Track Record, okay, and I'm running back and forth, Tommy, man, what the fuck else you do to this shit? How many ways can you EQ a kick? How many, how much reverb can you put? This shit sucks. I said, you know what, Tommy? I'm going to call Kevin Lewis. So I called Kevin Lewis. I'm like, Kevin, I don't know what's going on, but, you know, we need to fix this song. So there's a percussionist in the studio, Timbali. Got him to come in and play some percussions. Kevin came over from Can-Am. Kevin Lewis is Ramsey Lewis's son. Sat down at the piano, and that's who's playing that piano part. The bass line... I forgot his name, but an, uh, uh, another session player came in. Session player, just like Ricky Rouse, came in and played the bass. Okay? So when I look at it, I say, well, you know, I think that's foul. You wait until a person dies, and then you feel vindicated. Well, I can, I can speak up now, and I can, I can sue the state and get $100,000 or whatever, and, I, you know, I just look at that and go like, wow, okay. I guess that's how people are, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, they do different things. Same thing with the the stuff ending up in the swap meets or wherever it is. For whatever reason, somebody felt a need to be vindicated for, you know, I guess some some stuff they was harboring. I never, I never quite got that. <laughs> Why did you leave Death Row Records? Um, because there was uh, no more work. There was no more Death Row. And so um, what I ended up doing, well, I always, um, uh, during the time when, um, when um, we were doing Machiavelli, the good thing about that uh, that studio that you know that Tupac got mad at it and all that type of stuff. The good thing about that is it 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 it, it it's like um, within the same radius of track record here in North Hollywood, right? And so I had, I mean, that's the studio I started out working at. That studio, you know, that's my first studio and stuff like that. I had a, a, a great relationship with the owner, a great relationship with the manager. And so I was able to call over there. And once I told them who it was, they made room. Come on over. We're going to put you in, in the north room, which is the, the same room that Warren G. always worked in. All right? So we got over there. Now, once things was over with, with uh, Death Row, I continued work, doing part-time work at um, Track Record. Um, I did that, and then I got a uh, my gig. I got another gig over at a, um, a 
uh, record plant, the record plant with Rose Mann uh, in Hollywood. And then I started um, working with a uh, bunch of other guys. Uh, I ended up doing um, uh, uh, some songs on the Marshall Mathers album, Stan. I got a, uh, a, a Grammy for that. And, Congratulations. And, you know, it's like it was, it was a great death row with a great learning experience because that's the way I looked at it. Um, uh, again... I started out, you know, at the bottom doing what most cats who just get out of school and stuff would do, running and cleaning and trying to work my way into the room. I got into the room. Another opportunity presented itself. It was a great opportunity. Um, I got promoted, and I got the experience that I needed to, to move to the next level. And I just kept doing that. So it wasn't a matter of, of leaving if the place was still, or, 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 or you know, talking hindsight, if, 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 if it was still uh, producing records and, you know, uh, uh, a credible business right now, I'd probably still be doing a little something over there. But again, I, I, it, it, it served it the uh, facility, and um, the company itself served its purpose to me. I left, and I left on a good note. Like I said um, earlier, I have no resentment against uh, the the uh, the ex owner. Um, I I never got slapped up. I um, I got paid, and um, I got a good education over there on on the ins and outs of the uh, the record industry, the record business. You know. No, no doubt, man. Uh, do Do you have a project that you're working on now that you'd like me to plug throughout this interview? Um, not really. <laughs> Not really. I've been doing. You know what? What I have been doing. What I have been doing is I've been doing uh, um, some remixes for um, for the Outlaws. Okay. Um, I've been doing. Uh, and, and, and when when I say remixes, I've been doing you know straight up the writing of the music and you know the uh, the the record. I'm taking their vocals and I'm putting it on. Um, new music, and this is stuff that they did uh, right after uh, Tupac passed. Um, I'm taking all the, I'm taking mm, around uh, 16 to 20 something songs that was just on some sorry tracks, <laughs> you know, all out of tune and everything, and I'm putting it on on music that's in the right keys, and you know. Um, is this the Lost Ret Ret Retribution album? Oh no no no! I, I I had that for a while and and um, that's finally out. Um, I, I I gave that to uh, to to Noble and Edie um, a couple of years ago, like two years ago. But I had that forever. And <laughs> I, I had that I, I had that record. I used to listen to that record. Everybody was like, "Who is that?" I'm like, "Well." That's just a, a record, <laughs> you know, and even on that record, um, uh, um, uh, I did a lot of production on that one, too. Um, that's when I actually started doing some production, but, you know, after a while, the Outlaws came with their own label, and I, um, I engineered for them. So that was also part of, 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 of the leaving of death row it's like you never really left for me put it this way when that was over i lived in pasadena at the time like i told you and uh nate dog came knocking on my door it's like lance come on let's go where we going go to the studio record so i'll go to the studio record i i i, I mixed uh, a couple of songs for him and um, i ended up uh, building a studio at his house out in claremont Okay, so um, then at, during that time, Snoop had his uh, 
his um his doggy style records um Claremont went out there did some work some recording and stuff on ADAT and all that stuff for him he had like two studios out there um uh still doing uh independent work with um the record plant like i said um and the outlaws so i you know i i had i i i, I somehow developed a client list and you know so cats would be okay lance need you over here okay lance need you over here okay lance so it's like oh, okay whatever you know and it again it worked for me because um i was i was uh, automatically thrust into the the freelance world and um you know i worked at a quite a bit of studios out here i i i, I used to do a, a um a stay at sound castle out in atwater village um they're gone now along with a, a, a shitload of studios that used to be out there even even uh ocean waves is is gone as of uh earlier this year but um yeah i did i did quite a tour even did some aftermath stuff like i said you know the m m um i did some stuff with uh uh puff daddy um i did stuff with r kelly I did shit with Celine D. Uh, oh man, I did a shitload of shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, worked up in Seattle, Washington, for like two years, running a studio up there, working with one artist, and um, you know, it's I'm, I'm I'm enjoying what I do, and um, I've, I've I've you know in the process I've I've, I've grown and I'm. I'm doing I'm doing some different things in my life, you know. No doubt. And in closing, do you have a message for the fans at TupacNation.net? Well, um, the only message I have is to uh, to hold your, you know, hold your head and uh, you know keep looking out. I'm gonna keep looking out for the signs because uh, Tupac always uh, he spoke in the la you know towards the end about the uh, Illuminati, and um, it's pretty real. You just got to open your eyes and look around, and you'll see it. You know, that's the message I have. No doubt, Lance. I, I appreciate it, brother. Thank you for a great okay. interview. One well, love, my man, Jeff. <laughs> hey, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll hit you with a rough draft when I edit it. I'll edit okay. it down, and I'll so you can hear it before I post it. Okay, okay, so, no problem, man. Dude, you you told me a lot of shit, man, and and it's it's a great interview. This is going to be a great interview, and I appreciate it. No problem, no problem, no problem. I'm just glad that we got it done because. Uh, <laughs> <you know, laughs> I know, man. Okay, man. You know, you know, call me when you're ready. Call me when you're ready. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you know. I, 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 you know, and then I run into Tommy, and Tommy's like, "Did you do the interview yet?" And I'm like, "Well, well, I thought my man was gonna call me when he's ready. I thought he was out of town or something." <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad that we got, um, we got the opportunity to just link up and, and uh, you know, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to just, you know, I, what I call, spit the truth, tell the truth. That's all. I ain't, ain't no lies. It's all the truth, and there's a whole lot, a whole shitload more shit. But you know, that's uh, that's for my book. This is a J Mix exclusive. What up, Pushana?